Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, BeatScad research update. So we're back back live in the room. So um, we're going to hand over now to Dr. David Adlam, who's our lead researcher. So if I stop sharing and then you may speak. <laughs> That's very kind of you. Um, so I shall sh share a screen in a moment. So my, my remit here is uh, to catch you all up with uh, some of the research progress that we've been making and to try and explain some of the things that we've been learning about SCAD um, through, that, through the research. But um, just before I do that, I'm gonna just say a big thank you to Alice Wood, who you've just seen um for her you know amazing contribution both in terms of uh supporting the research uh and uh the uh, clinical service that we um that we run for SCAD patients so we're very grateful to her and also because um I will almost certainly try and make sure that I get in somewhere again at the end but I also want to thank the um trustees of Beat SCAD the awesome doyen of our community um who you're seeing are running today who are just amazing people and uh, um, you know we couldn't do any of the research that we do uh, or any of the um, clinical support that we do without them so they are amazing so um, uh, I'm going to uh, I'm hoping am I sharing a screen can you see a screen with some slides on it Give me a nod, Beck. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. So um, I'm just going to talk through um, some of the research stuff and totally happy to take questions at the end. So the research obviously focuses on all sorts of different aspects of SCAD and trying to understand the condition better and also trying to sort of help doctors who are coming across the condition to make the right decisions about how best to look after patients. So I'm going to start with uh, questions around diagnosis, and these are um, a couple of uh, papers that we've published um, looking at the diagnostic questions. And one of the challenges with SCAD is twofold. First of all, that um, it is a condition that's easily missed, and there will be people on this call who've had the experience of having SCAD and it taking time for um, the medical teams from the kind of paramedic through to the uh, cardiologist, if you like, for the penny to drop. Uh, and that's of course, because the common cause of heart attacks, atherosclerosis is more common in men and older people and people who have particular risk factors and SCAD patients often don't fit that profile. Also, at the other side of the spectrum is the fact that most SCAD is diagnosed on the coronary angiogram. And the coronary angiogram has typical appearances in SCAD, which make most cases, uh, once you're familiar with it, relatively easy to recognize. But it won't surprise you to learn that there are also cases where the appearances are less typical. And also, there are sometimes other things which are not SCAD, which can mimic SCAD. And of course, it's really very important that we make the right diagnosis. And um, one of the things that we do in the SCAD clinic is just to think really carefully about that. And I'd say there are perhaps maybe one in 10 of the patients that are referred to the clinical service where ultimately the diagnosis is either not certainly SCAD or where the diagnosis is likely or definitely something that isn't SCAD. And obviously these things are uh, very important things to, uh, to understand. And again, some of you will have been through an experience of having a whole bunch of tests, um, uh, either from the SCAD clinic or on the advice of the SCAD clinic to try and make the diagnosis a little bit uh, a clearer or more certain so that we can then make the right decisions. And making the right diagnosis is important right from the beginning in the, in the cath lab, if we're thinking about, you know, should we go down the stents route or not the stents route? And also subsequently in terms of thinking about the best approach to medical treatments and other treatments after recovery. So the paper at the top here is a collaboration with our friends in the Mayo Clinic in, uh, in Minnesota. Uh, and essentially what we did here was to try to put together a series of coronary angiograms and imaging and pictures to help clinicians 
to try and get the diagnosis right, to recognize things that can mimic SCAD and to recognize SCAD when it's not, you know, if you like fitting the textbook picture to try to help people. And um, uh, so that was that paper. Um, so an educational paper, I suppose that would be. The paper at the bottom, Tina mentioned a little bit about this in her talk about FMD. Clearly, again, given some of the things I've just said, it would help us if we could have a blood test or a, a series of blood markers, which would give us greater certainty about the diagnosis of SCAD. And this would help uh, on many fronts. It would help in some of these less angiographically clear cases. So the, the gray cases or the mimics that I was mentioning a little bit earlier it would help us to be more certain. Um, it would also potentially help in, in a small number of cases where you know, we felt that maybe an invasive angiogram wasn't needed if the diagnosis could be made accurately. So a blood test would be helpful there to prevent, potentially prevent um, uh, the, having to go down that invasive strategy. And this is a, a paper and you'll, you'll, you'll uh, if you like, see this uh, again and again in what we present in that these are collaborations. Obviously the UK SCAD study is a collaboration with many, many hospitals, trusts, doctors across the UK who support us, send us uh, referrals and uh, guide patients to the research arena. And also, um, again, in terms of getting more numbers and more traction on SCAD, it's enormously beneficial to be able to work with international partners. And we work with many of those, the Mayo Clinic and the paper above. This paper at the bottom here is a collaboration predominantly with partners in Spain. Um, and what they did was they looked at uh, the blood taken from patients at the time they're presenting with SCAD. So these were the, if you like, the patients on the day when we were able to take blood samples from patients predominantly in Leicester and also in Spanish sites. And what we were able to identify was an initial signal of some markers within the blood, these things called MIRs or microRNAs, um, which um, gave a profile that was able to distinguish between SCAD and other causes of heart attacks. This is preliminary, and I think Tina mentioned it, um, and needs lots more validation. And again, lots more um, blood samples, particularly from those acute patients, to be able to sort of firm up and get to the point where this is a test that can actually be used. But it's a first step to saying, actually, in SCAD patients, there are blood markers out there that may enable us to distinguish between SCAD and something else using a blood test. Lots more work to be done to, to make that reality, but a first signal to suggest it might be useful. So um, moving on from the initial diagnosis to the uh, treatment in the cath lab. So what to do with patients? And I suppose this is the question about conservative treatment. So not putting stents in versus uh, putting stents in. And um, uh, this is the paper. Again, you'll see um, that there are a broad range of collaboration, collaborators here, um, many of them from the UK, but also from Italy, from Poland, um, uh, uh, who are contributing, sorry, and Dutch colleagues and Spanish colleagues. So, you know, it's a, it, it's a broad brush of people that are contributing here to this work um, to allow us to sort of delve into trying to understand where the risk benefit balance lies for stenting. And to give the background, many of you will be familiar that the message in scanned patients in uh, over the, the last few years has been one that the conservative management is best if it is possible. So not going down the lines of stents is best if it is possible. However, it isn't always possible. I think this is a really important message because sometimes I'll get patients will come to clinic and they'll say, well, I had stents and maybe that was a mistake. But actually, there are situations when stents are needed. And to some extent, we've seen a little bit of the pendulum maybe swinging a little bit too far in the direction of not putting stents in, in some situations where there's a, a blockage in a coronary artery that's supplying a large amount of heart muscle where it might, might uh, have been the best thing to do to try and do something to reopen flow in that vessel. So this was a paper that was trying to understand where that balance should lie, who should be the thinking about stents and who should we not be thinking about stents. And 
This is just to illustrate, if you like, the issue, the problem. I, um, you may be able to see my little cursor here. So as you know, um, uh, um, SCAD arises from a bruise that develops in the wall of the artery, as you heard me wittering about earlier in the um, in the um, video that you, you saw, coronary arteries of a tube taking blood to the heart muscle. But of course, the tube isn't paper thin because it's under your blood pressure. And if it was under your blood pressure, it was paper thin, it would just burst. So we've uh, developed our arteries with a wall of muscle around them. And so they have a thickness, a bit like a tire around them. And the bruise, as you can see here, actually develops in the wall. And then as pressure rises within the bruise, it squashes the artery from the outside. And that's what causes the obstruction to flow. The problem is, is that when you expand stents to, if you like, try to reopen uh, the vessel and if you like to squeeze the bruise out of the way, what happens is the bruise or the blood in the wall, it can track and it can actually just create a narrowing upstream or downstream of where your stent is. And this is very different to what happens in the common form of heart attacks, atherosclerosis, where you get that altered fat and lipid in the vessel wall. When you expand a stent in that case, in a stent in that case, it's unusual for it to, excuse me, track in this way. And this is just an angiogram to illustrate the problem. And this is a, a patient with SCAD and um, a stent is uh, put in here. And you can see, hopefully, that flow is lost in this blood vessel going across the skyline. And it's tracking back into the uh, um, the blood vessel here, and this is a, a problem. So this is why we think carefully about whether or not to stent. And the uh, reason we uh, prefer not putting stents in if it is appropriate is because we know that if uh, patients with SCAD are, are able to be managed without stents, then this bruise, so you, you can see here is red is the lumen of the blood vessel where the blood should be flowing. And the black here is the bruise. And you can see how that bruise squashes the artery down so that it becomes very narrow. So it goes, as it gets into the area where the bruise is, where the SCAD is, you can see how much narrower the artery becomes. And then over time, you can see that these black areas where the bruise is lying, as they reabsorb, as any bruise does in your body, the bruise in the wall of the coronary artery reabsorbs, the body takes it away over time you can see that the blood vessel starts to re-expand. And we know that over time, sorry about that, over time, you will, uh, the, uh, if you like, the anatomy in, of the coronary arteries returns to normal um, over a period of time. That healing period generally happens quite quickly and is completed in most patients by around six months after the SCAD event, but most of it happens in the first few weeks. So this is the cost of stenting, uh, as we demonstrated in this paper. What happens is if you have to go down the line of stents, you find that in some patients, at least you need quite a few stents because you're having to sort of chase this bruise as it tracks along the wall. So complications of one sort or another if uh, patients go down the line of stenting are quite common. And that's usually due to either the bruise extending here or sometimes you can also get damage related to the actual procedure due to the catheters or the instrumentation of the artery, we call that iatrogenic dissection. So these are some of the issues. But the important message of this paper is that there's also benefit to stenting in some patients. And this is looking at flow in the artery. And what it's showing is, uh, this is just a score. So if you've got, um, this is looking at, at the change in flow. So if you're zero, stenting hasn't made any difference to your flow. If you're going down this way, flow in the artery is getting worse after stenting. If you're going up this way, flow is getting better after stenting. And what it's essentially showing you is that in those patients who were selected for stenting by their doctor, so this is not a clinical trial where patients are randomized to stenting or not. This is observational data. But there, uh, you can see that there are um, a, a group of patients for whom there is a significant and important improvement in flow as a result of stenting. And actually those in which the flow is made worse as a result of stenting are, are quite small. There's a, a bunch in which there's no improvement and no deterioration. But um, there is clearly a benefit of stenting in some patients. And I think um, what we hoped the message of this paper would give was a clearer understanding for clinicians to decide who should we be thinking about stenting or PCI or doing something to the coronary artery and who is it okay to sit tight 
and manage them conservatively. Most patients we still think should be managed conservatively, but there are some patients, particularly those with blockages that are, if you like, more at the beginning or in the middle of an important blood vessel where it may be necessary to do something. And we're also starting at least to discuss what the best treatment strategies are. And this is a treatment strategy which is using a little balloon, which can, uh, it's called a cutting balloon, and it can basically fenestrate between the true lumen in the middle here and the false lumen, which is where the bruise lies outside it here. And what you'll see is this is what it looks like before, where you've got this squashed true lumen and the bruise around the outside. And again, you can see here the bruise, and this is a very tiny true lumen. It's been squashed almost flat here. And this is what happens after you use the cutting balloon, that you get this um, fenestration between the true lumen and the, full, uh, and the false lumen. This opens up the artery. And it's also suggested that this may be a technique that makes stenting safer where you need to do it. And the reason for that is that you can imagine as the stent expands here, the false lumens can depressurize because it's already got a perforation in it. And so that means it's less likely that it's going to track along uh, the vessel and cause problems. So this is quite a technical paper, but it's something that we hope will help those cardiologists who um, see scanned patients in the cath lab to make the right choices about who should get uh, stenting or who should have coronary intervention, who should be managed conservatively, and at least to start to open up the question as to how to treat those um, who do need intervention. And I think also to the patient community to understand that there are cases, there will always be cases that need stents, and there will always be scanned patients that, you know, occasional scanned patients who may be better served with a bypass operation. These, uh, uh, these things will not change. And if you've had stenting or had a bypass operation, it doesn't mean you've had the wrong thing. It just means that your case um, you know, hopefully is one of those that's been carefully selected because it was felt that that was the best approach to treat you. So um, uh, uh, some other uh, work of relevance as well in terms of these decisions, which is looking at the outcomes, how much injury and scarring is there on the heart after SCAD. Um, and uh, this is a paper where, which comes from all of uh, uh, the patients, many of you who attended for cardiac MRI in Leicester, and it's looking at these um, convalescent MRI scans. And the message is an important one, I think, again, for patients, alluded, uh, and alludes a little bit to the comp some of the comments I made at the beginning, which is that actually, yes, there is a reduction in the ejection fraction, the pumping function of the heart, uh, in patients who have SCAD. But actually, overall, if you look at the median, the middle patients with uh, in the SCAD community, the degree of reduction is very small. Now, obviously, there's a range around that. You will get some patients who do have more severe uh, injuries as a result of their SCAD. But the overall average of that is actually a very small degree of damage. And again, what we found was that almost 40% of patients in the scanner had no measurable injury and the long-term follow-up using the MRI scan. It doesn't mean there won't be a scar there. It just means it's too small for the scanner to detect. But of course, that also means that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be causing the heart any uh, problems in terms of its performance. So yes, there will always be some patients that we need to look after who have had larger um, heart attacks, but the majority of cases, in the majority of scanned cases, the injuries are small. And of course, this also has relevance because of the recurrence risk, which we're familiar with with SCAD, and it's something that we have to sort of get our heads around and think about. And one of the messages from this paper is to say, yes, Obviously, recurrent SCAD you mean, does mean you, 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 you get a sort of a further uh, injury to the heart. But again, those injuries are small. And that's one of the reasons why the prognosis, the outcome of SCAD in most patients is very good. So the causes of SCAD, um, you know, uh, lots to learn here, but uh, uh, quite a lot of progress is uh, being made and I should say, I probably should have said at the very beginning that the papers that we're talking about and presenting here, all, all of them are supported with the funding from, uh, from BeatScan.
And I'm only going to show you that these are just papers from the last, from this year and last year, just because I think you, it, you'll um, you, you'll all have dozed off if I go back to the very beginning. So this is this is just sort of selected highlights from the last two years. So uh, genetics, these are just some of the genetics papers um, that we've published in the last two years on SCAD. We are learning more about the genetics of this condition, and I'll explain a bit about what we uh, currently understand. There are a very small number of patients for whom um, there is a rare causal gene. So these, this is the sort of thing that would run in families, for example. However, those rare causal genes, first of all, they occur in a very small group of patients. So three or four percent of the whole SCAD population. So 96 to 97 percent won't have these genes. And secondly, they are usually associated with other known conditions. So the commonest gene in the gene sequencing study, which is this paper down the bottom here, um, uh, was the adult polycystic kidney disease gene. And so again, it's something that, you know, there may be so somebody on the call who has adult polycystic kidney disease, um, but, you know, this, these are a, a, a rare um, a group of patients. Uh, over here, we have the Louis Dietz syndrome, and there are others, the vascular Erlos-Danlos uh, syndrome and the Marfan syndrome, for example. So, the majority of patients who have these rare variants will have another known condition or will have a strong family history or will have something about their appearance to the doctor or their scan findings, which tells us that this is a patient who may have a rare variant. And it, it is for this reason that at the moment, and this is obviously an area that we're learning about all the time, but at the moment, we are not recommending, and indeed it's not uh, funded in the UK, uh, to uh, get uh, genetic screening in SCAD patients and their families, because the number of rare variants involved is very small, and they as associate with known disorders that would have a kind of clear-cut history or family history that we would be able to identify. So that's what we're starting to understand about rare variants. It's not a condition that for the most part runs strongly in families and has single genes that are causal for most patients. But I'll just go back. I, was, I haven't put the factor one uh, uh, gene uh, thing on here because actually it was outside my two year window. Um, but we are also working hard to look at common genetic variants. These are what Tina was described as described them as risk factors, which is quite a good way of thinking about them. They are genes which we all have. They're common in the population. It's more to do, if you think of it this way, as uh, of the combination of those genes, the, the hand that you're dealt when you're born, that confers whether you have risk or not. Uh, uh, Factor one was the first of these genes that um, we described with our French uh, uh, and uh, uh, collaborators um, a couple of years ago now, 2019, I think that paper was out. So that's the first common variant that was described in SCAD. We're working together with international partners in France, Australia, uh, and the US and Canada. So this is uh, really one of the very first um, efforts that involves, you know, pretty much all of the big international players um, to produce what's called a genome-wide association study, and this is something that we're uh, actively pursuing at this time, and um, you know, hope to be able to update you on the findings of next year. So, lots more to learn from a genetics perspective. One of the interesting things that's emerging from the common variants with factor one and other genes that have been described so far is that the genes which um, confer a little bit of risk, and as I've said, it's, it's lots of little bits of risk that, um, that contribute here, but these genes uh, do seem to often be protective against the common form of, uh, 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 of coronary artery disease and the common cause for heart attacks, atherosclerosis, the cholesterol and, and so on, a related uh, disorder. So it seems that the risk, if you have a higher risk of SCAD, then you have a lower risk of 
atherosclerotic disease. And that fits with the fact that when we look at the coronary angiograms of SCAD patients, finding significant atherosclerotic disease at the same time is uncommon. So all sorts of interesting things uh, that we are learning, lots more to learn, but um, really rapid progress in the world of SCAD genetics. Uh, so this was another paper, uh, again, collaborative with uh, colleagues in uh, Holland, um, uh, London Mary Shepherd Key here and Australia, um, looking at um, the if you like the cell level of the appearance of the, uh, of the coronary arteries, but also we also used the um, skin biopsies that um, many of you kindly provided to have a look at the connective tissue of patients. And what this paper did um, was as well as kind of provide a greater understanding um, and help to people that are looking, uh, looking for SCAD in the context of um, patients uh, who, sadly die suddenly, it was also focused on debunking a number of theories about SCAD. So some of these theories, I'll, I'll just go through a few of them. So for example, there was a theory that SCAD was basically caused by inflammation of the wall of the coronary artery, a sort of arteritis, if you like it, itis meaning inflammation and arter, arter bit being the artery. And what this paper showed was that, yes, there is inflammation of the wall, but that it increases over time and therefore is much more likely to be a response to injury than the cause. There was another theory that there would be more little microvessels in the wall of the coronary artery. And again, we demonstrated this, this was time dependent. And so although, yes, there, there was an increase in the number of uh, these microvessels, that this was something that happened over time and was probably a response to injury rather than, um, uh, if you like, a uh, the underlying cause. And then in terms of the connective tissue, we, we found some subtle hints that some of the some of the um, very subtle features of elastin, the elastic element of connective tissue, might be different in scanned patients. Um, but the, I think the main message was that the structure of connective tissue, at least in the, uh, in the skin connective tissue that we looked at, wasn't grossly abnormal. And so we need to think about more subtle things. We do think the connective tissue is involved, but we need to think about whether there may be more subtle changes than, if you like, the gross changes that we looked at here in terms of the, the fibrils, their shape, their size, how they look like, and so on. So this is a paper um, that really delved down into some of the theories, is able to debunk some, but also able to open the door on some other um, questions that, that need to be looked at in a little bit more detail as we move forward. So an important piece of progress there in terms of drilling down and really asking the questions about some of the theories underlying SCAD. So this uh, is uh, just a paper about the combination of autoimmune disease and SCAD. And what, one of the challenges in, in the SCAD literature, and you, I, I think hopefully you can understand this, is that obviously SCAD occurs in the population uncommonly. And every now and again, by chance, it will occur in a patient who has, happens to have something else. And um, it's very tempting to then say that that something else and SCAD are connected and that um, there's a link between them, which makes the person who has disease X vulnerable to, to SCAD. One of those things that we've had very recently, which we've been carefully thinking about, is the association between SCAD and COVID-19 vaccination. So again, COVID-19 vaccination, the whole population's being vaccinated. And so there will be some patients whose SCAD happens to, by chance, occur close to the time at which you have a COVID-19 vaccination. But that doesn't mean the COVID-19 vaccination caused the SCAD, it's just that if you vaccinate a population, rare events will, will continue to happen. And so they will happen at the same time in some patients. And we've been obviously thinking and monitoring and looking very carefully as to whether there is you know, more than we would expect of a link between those two things. And we haven't seen it, which is why we continue to advise patients to get uh, their COVID vaccinations and to get both vaccinations and follow the guidance from that perspective. We can, of course, take questions on that later. But this is a paper uh, that is our comment on a paper from our friends and colleagues at the Mayo Clinic, who did a very nice study 
looking to see whether the reported links between SCAD and autoimmune diseases were, if you like, demonstrable when you had a control population, when you had a comparator population. And essentially, they showed that, yes, you do get autoimmune diseases in SCAD, but these appear to be um, at, occurring at the same frequency as we would expect in a matched population. And therefore, they're more likely to be coincident, so happening at the same time, rather than causation. And these are really important little incremental steps because these messages get stuck in the medical literature and we have to sort of debunk them so that we can make sure we're focusing on the right um, uh, directions in terms of the causes of SCAD. So what about after SCAD? Um, you know, we're very aware of important um, aspects around uh, cardiac rehabilitation. I know we've got um, a cardiac rehabilitation uh, um, uh, expert, actually, who's the partner of one of the scared patients that was talking at the beginning. So uh, this is an area that is, you know, really close to um, uh, our mission in terms of making sure that patients benefit from a chronic rehabilitation. And obviously, part of that is trying to say, well, what do we think patients should and should not be doing from an exercise perspective? And uh, this is a paper that, that's been published. I think most of these papers are available. They're open access and available um, to read. And the BeatScad trustees and their colleagues are very good also in providing summaries and uh, explanations of them. So this is what um, at the summary, if you like, of the paper. And essentially what we're saying is, you know, most things go after SCAD. Exercise is good for the heart. It's good for the head. If you're somebody that did exercise before your SCAD, it will be an important part of getting back to normality. There are a relatively small number of things that we're not keen on. Lifting weights that cause you to change a normal pattern of breathing. So if you have to go to lift it up, if that makes sense, then it's probably too heavy for you. Whereas toning weights, things that you can do whilst maintaining a normal pattern of breathing are perfectly acceptable. In terms of aerobic exercise, you know, we tend to advise patients to just go a little bit, you know, back from the max, not exercising to extremes, not exercising to exhaustion, favoring regular repeated activity rather than, you know, going to the nth degree. And also after your uh, SCAD, it's about building up, which is where rehab and support from the rehab teams is so important because it often doesn't go well if you try and go from zero to hero. If you go too fast, you end up getting into this fluctuation of having a very active day where you do lots and then feeling exhausted and tired and getting post-scad chest pain and then not being able to do anything for a week and then uh, having another good day and having another go and that cycle gets repeated. So it's about trying to temper the good days, build up the bad days and then make an incremental progress. Contact sports. Um, you know, again, it, it, it makes sense to try to minimize those. That's not often a question that gets asked. Extreme head positions. Again, we sometimes get asked the roller coaster question. There's one or two reports of dissections in, in the head and neck vessels occurring in association with roller coasters. So it's those sudden flexion extension things in the neck um, that we advise uh, people to avoid if possible. But I think the most important message here is not necessarily the avoid box, but more that actually most things are, you know, are good and are going to help you to get back uh, to normal. And so uh, hopefully that's helpful. So as well as the sort of, if you like, trying to understand the causes, the genetics and all of those kind of aspects of SCAD, we also work hard, um, as do your amazing trustees, to try and advance education uh, across the spectrum. So this is uh, clinicians, the doctors, the nurses, the cardiac rehabilitation teams, ambulance crews, obstetricians and gynecologists who deal with PSCAD patients and so on. And uh, the, the BeatScad group have done incredible work here. So um, we've continued to work again internationally. There's a paper at the top there. I'm not showing you all of these, but there's a paper at the top there, um, uh, just uh, uh, sharing advice about SCAD management to our Polish international colleagues. And a very important paper, again, uh, collaborating with our friends at the Mayo Clinic 
um, a state-of-the-art review in this journal of the American College of Cardiologists, which is a kind of, it's a very highly read um, journal, so it has a lot of uh, impact in terms of uh, people looking at it and referencing it, so a really important work. And then with our European partners, we've also uh, written the first uh, textbook chapter dedicated to SCAD uh, in this really important European textbook um, on, uh, so this is the textbook basically that for uh, cardiologists who do interventions who are going to see these patients in the cath lab. And this is a really long detailed um, uh, uh, chapter that contains all of the elements and again we're really uh, hopeful and optimistic that this will uh, have a you know a really international because of course these are textbooks that international parties not just European parties will be reading and learning from and and this is an updatable chapter as well so we can continue to update it in the future. Um, I that is uh, probably a tad too soon I wondered whether we would just hear back about our um, paper um, on extracoronary arteriopathies so, um, that, again, many of you comp contributed to by going through the scanner here in Leicester or in, in other institutions to look at all the other arteries in the body. Um, this is, I think, on the verge of being accepted as a manuscript. I thought we might hear today. We haven't quite heard, but we've been told that it's nearly, nearly there. So I think that um, we can maybe catch up on that one next year. So I, I just wanted to end by um, adding um, uh, my thanks to, first of all, to BeatScad, to their amazing fundraisers, because research unfortunately costs money, salaries are more expensive than, uh, than I could believe when I started doing research, uh, when you add on all of the extra costs and things that arise from it. So it's an expensive business. I, I hope that you know, some of these uh, outputs uh, um, uh, are, are, are interesting and show that, you know, all of those cakes that have been baked, those marathons that have been run, those events that uh, people have attended and contributed to, Christmas cards that you've bought, jerseys that you're wearing, and so on, that they have made an incredible difference to um, not just SCAD in the UK, but to our international understanding of this disease uh, and what causes it and hopefully, you know, improving our care and management of these patients. I think it's also important to, to say, you know, you've heard the names of, of a few institutions, but um, SCAD research is an international effort. And, you know, I think it's hugely important to acknowledge um, the incredible contribution from others internationally, the Mayo Clinic, the Vancouver Hospital, um, the Mass General and uh, others in the US, uh, and also our friends in France, Holland, Spain, and so many other places internationally that have all contributed um, to the um, uh, to the research that I've presented today. And also Belgium, Alexandra pursues right at the top there, and I didn't say Belgium. So you know, I, I, I'll, I'll have missed a country, but that just hopefully shows you how a collaborative. Uh, these things are. And that's so important, really, because um, everybody has to get, you know, sort of give a bit. It's, it's that world of sort of, you know, n not everybody can lead on every study. And people have to be prepared to say, do you know what, you can have our data to make your paper bigger, to make us, you know, to enable us to understand a bit more. And I think the uh, SCAD research community internationally is an incredible example of how that can be done uh, positively. So thanks to basically loads of people. Um, and that was sort of the end of my little research update. And there's more in the pipeline. Um, so do join again uh, at the next update and we'll tell you what, uh, what we've learnt um, in the next bit. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Thank you.